people have this concept that like being an entrepreneur is this like sexy jet set experience where you know people are just answering the phone for you and doing things for you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tell you guys that go ahead, I want everyone to quit your nine to five. You probably shouldn't. I could tell you guys about a period of my life as an entrepreneur where I probably didn't get a paycheck for about two and a half years. Hey, what's up YouTube? Happy Vlogmas. It's Christine with Gage Girl Training, an online meal planning and coaching service. I'm a food scientist and chemical engineer, and today I'm going to be talking about when I decided to quit my nine to five job. So let's get started. So first things first, I wanted to shout out this sweater I'm wearing that was purchased from amazon.com. It is super comfy, cozy, winter white. You can kind of do off the shoulder with it. You can do both shoulders. I kind of like the whole one shoulder look maybe because I'm a baby of the 80s. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's cute. The link is below if you guys want to check it out, but I'm really enjoying it. And I've asked some people in my private Facebook forum about what they wanted to hear me talk about on Vlogmas. And we started to touch on finance on some videos and somebody asked me in the Team Gage Girl private accountability forum, when did you quit your nine to five job and stop working as a chemical engineer and how did you get into what you're doing now? And I thought it'd be really cool to fill in the pieces for you guys. And if this video gets good feedback, awesome. If not, I probably won't talk about this stuff on this channel, but I wanted to get a little bit more personal this year with Vlogmas and give you guys the information that you really want to know about me. So here goes. All right, so you guys know from all of my videos that I am a scientist and I always say at the beginning of my videos that I am a chemical engineer by training. What does that mean? That means I am formally educated in chemical and biological engineering. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in that and I went to Drexel University to study that. Once I graduated college, I went on to work for DuPont. DuPont is a Fortune 100 company and I did very well there. And it was a very good job. DuPont, I felt like, it was like a finishing school. It was a very class act organization. I learned so much from that company. I had a lot of great mentors there. I have nothing bad to say about that company whatsoever. However, for me, I think something started to happen to me early on in my career. So I was obviously very thrilled to be doing what I was doing. I was working as a process engineer, technically in title, but my role stemmed several different facets. So I had experience in scaling up chemical processes. So what that means is we would develop a product in a lab and we would enter into a contract with a customer that wants to purchase that product. And the customers that we engaged with were in Japan, they were in Germany, and I got to work with the customers on developing the product, developing the specs, and it was really great. I was very fortunate to work with a company at a time when we were developing a brand new technology. That meant that the technology we sold the customer, we did not have the means to manufacture that product on a large scale. So this is a chemical engineer's dream. I got to be a part of the scale up team, got to be a part of scaling up that process. I actually got to be a part of defining some of the process variables, mm -hmm. as well as you know interacting with the customer, making sure all of the supplies were, were met, um, seeing a plant built from scratch, and I learned a lot, grew a lot, and it was great. However, it got to a point where being very young and being very ambitious, I had this fire in my stomach to grow. This fire in my stomach to just take my career to the next level. And maybe it was because I was young and naive. I thought that, you know, if you work hard, if you're killing it for the company, you know, if you're doing these things above and beyond, you would think that you would be rewarded for that. And unfortunately, larger companies just move at a much slower pace than was satisfactory to me. And because of that, I decided 
that I needed to branch out. I needed to be at a place and in an environment that moved a bit faster. So what does that mean? For those of you, you know, who work the nine to five, I call it, you know, working for the man, so to speak. There was some slang we used to have, um, you know, we called it working for Uncle Doopy. <laughs> you know, it's just when you don't call the shots when it's in a big company and you know, it's kind of like being on an aircraft carrier. It moves at a very slow pace because there's just a lot of factors that come into play. And being young, obviously not fully understanding that, um, you know, I had paid vacation, I had full health benefits, I had my 401k, I had all that I was set, but it wasn't enough for me. I had this urge to create results, to have things happen, to see change, to make improvements, to have my voice and my opinion matter. And once I started realizing that that wasn't cutting it for me, that was when I decided I needed to branch out. So when I branched out, I took some calculated risks. I moved into a different sector. I moved into the biotech field. And in that, I moved to a significantly smaller company. And this small company that I worked for was a great experience for me because I learned and started to quench that thirst for my entrepreneurial spirit. It was in the smaller company that I saw, if you had an idea, I had a really great boss and a really great role model there who really empowered me to run with my ideas and we've turned them into projects, we've turned them into products, we've pitched them to customers and those customers bought them. We pitched things to boards of directors and it was when I started to engage with things on a smaller scale in terms of the scope of the company, but the pressure to perform was much higher in a smaller company because if your company's not doing well, obviously you're not gonna get paid. <laughs> and this is just the bottom line. And once I started to realize that my impact mattered in a much bigger way that like if I was crushing it in my job, when I say crushing it, I don't mean the type of crushing it where it's not just the nine to five. It's not just you showed up and you did what was expected of you. It was, I was always thinking about how to do things better. Like I was bringing my work home with me. I was getting there early. My ideas were always flowing. I was utilizing resources and contacts from other industries and introducing them to this company. I was always thinking my thirst to grow, my thirst to improve, my thirst and hunger to contribute on a larger scale was just peaked and I began to really grow in my confidence once I saw my work impacting businesses. I saw my work impacting contracts. I saw my work changing lives. I saw my work having an impact on our company's ability to gain funding. Once I started seeing things happen and realized that I had that capacity to do that, that was when I decided that I was ready for the next level of risk. So the thing about being an entrepreneur is you need to have the right stomach for it. You need to have this drive and hunger and you can never quench it enough that urge to grow, to improve. But the thing is, it is a very scary place because if you aren't on point, if you're not converting sales, if your work is not closing deals, if your research is not getting funding, if your contribution isn't cutting it financially and is not hitting the bottom line, guess what happens? You don't eat. <laughs> And I mean that very, very, very seriously. So when I decided that I was going to start taking some of these risks, I started consulting. And when I started consulting, I was kind of working for myself for the first times. So I was consulting with larger companies, smaller companies, and I was putting together projects and proposals. But the thing is, I was consulting as a chemical engineer. I was consulting in product development. I was consulting as a manufacturing consultant. I've consulted with companies all over the world, Asia, Europe, South America, all over the world. It was a really cool experience, but that was not my day job during that time. I had a full-time job, which I was not in compete of the contracts. I was consulting for different sectors. And the thing 
about that which was interesting is because these contracts are great once you can get them because obviously I'm doing all the work and I'm working for these companies as a contractor, as a consultant. And the thing is, that type of work is not steady, that type of work is not stable, and even though it pays well and you can do a lot with it, it's a high risk. And if you think that you want to quit your day job, I'm telling you to not do it. And the reason I'm telling you to not quit your day job until you are 1 million percent sure that you can sustain your standard of living doing whatever it is you really want to be doing because you are only two life circumstances away from complete and utter financial disaster. What I consider to be a life circumstance is let's say you crash your car or let's say you get terminally sick and it's just gonna be a big insurance payout, you can't work. Or let's say you have some unforeseen expense. If you have two of those doozies happen at the same time, you're not gonna make it. So I'm telling you, don't quit your day job until whatever side hustle you have going is enough to make the kind of money you need to live off of. So how much money do you need to live? My rule of thumb, we're getting a little into personal finance here, my rule of thumb is that however much your take home pay is after taxes, 25% of your take home pay should be towards your living expense, meaning like your rent or your mortgage. So let's say hypothetically you make $1,000 a week in one month, that's $4,000 just using really simple math. So 25% of $4,000 is 1,000. So you should not be spending more than $1,000 a month on your rent or your mortgage. Now granted, that's, you can have a roommate, you could have a significant other, but for safety, for security, I've always lived by the rule of thumb that you should always have a minimum of six to 12 months of living expenses saved up for a rainy day that you never touch just in case. And I've lived by that ever since I was, I believe, 18, 19 years old. You always have to plan for the worst. So when I decided that I was good at what I was doing, good enough at what I was doing that I could make a living off of it, I had the opportunity to become an owning partner in a manufacturing company and I established a whole manufacturing plant and we did uh, private label manufacturing in the dietary supplement industry. Now, Owning your own business, your name being on the lease, you needing to sign those monthly rent checks, you being the one that is responsible for people's paychecks, it is a whole another level of responsibility. And if you have a slow week, that's on you. And the thing is like you're always working from the moment you open your eyes to the moment you close your eyes. People have this concept that like being an entrepreneur is this like sexy jet set experience where you know people are just answering the phone for you and doing things for you. I feel like it is nothing but the complete and utter opposite of that. It is very stressful. It can be very rewarding if you're good at what you do, but it can be all consuming and it can be very, very scary at times. So I could tell you guys tons of horror stories. I could tell you guys about a period of my life as an entrepreneur where I, I probably didn't get a paycheck for about two and a half years. <laughs> I could tell you guys about times where, yes, things look good on paper, but the reality is it's scary as, <laughs> it's scary. I could tell you guys about, you know, big risks that have lots and lots of zeros. And the thing is you have to have confidence in your skills and you not only do you need to have confidence in your skills, you need to have confidence in the skills of those on your team. So I've probably made every mistake humanly possible known to man when it comes to this. But at the end of the day, I was able to find things that I liked, find things that I was good at and was able to bounce back and recover from my mistakes. So yes, while it may sound exciting and cool being able to say that, yes, your business has made over seven figures, that's that's cool. Yes, you've been able to do that more than once. Yes, that's cool. Yes, you've been able to do that three times. That's even cooler. But the amount of risk that goes with that, the amount of... <laughs> I probably have tumors in my stomach and if anyone here is an entrepreneur, you know that. 
And the thing is, it's, it's high risk, it's high reward. So you need to be willing to give it everything and you need to be able to stomach the hard times. When I say stomach the hard times, like I said, I've had at least two and a half years with, with no paycheck in the last seven years of my life. I've had times where I've completely depleted all of my, my personal resources towards my businesses and it's been scary. But the thing is, you know, if you are smart, if you are savvy, if you will just never refuse failure, you will land on your feet. But I'm telling you guys, do not expect it to be this fun experience because it's not gonna be fun. It's going to be hard. You gotta be serious about what you're doing. You gotta really want to do what you're doing. And no magical like venture capitalist or investor is just gonna magically put some you know, funds on your lap. You're gonna have to prove it. You're gonna have to do a lot of hard work. And the reality is you can be extremely successful, but you really need to be willing to do the above and beyond. It's not even just like, oh, well, I did a little bit extra. I should be rewarded, no. <laughs> You need to really be in a place that you're offering a value adding service to people that are willing to pay for it. And you need to be at a place where the margins make sense, the numbers make sense. Because at the end of the day, it's business. It's about making a profit. And as much as you want to be a bleeding heart and as much as you want to do this, 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 I, I do my best to be generous and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it is business and it is very hard. It is a very tough path. But the thing is, you can succeed. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it and tell you guys that go ahead. I want everyone to quit your nine to five. You probably shouldn't. The reality is you probably shouldn't until you have something lined up, like something legit, steady, lined up that is something that can be very consistent. And until that is all set up, I'm telling you don't do it. <laughs> I'm telling you don't do it because what's gonna happen is you're gonna be very frustrated. You are going to put yourself in a bad place financially because if you have staff, if you have this, you got bills, you got this, you gotta pay for those things. And you start looking at things differently because I'm sure those of you who you know work for a company, you don't think twice about like using your company's resources, like printing things out on the company computer. You guys probably don't think twice about taking your company's pens and papers. You don't think twice about um, the coffee in your office. You don't think twice about those gallons of water that you know, you're know you filling your bottle of water up. You better believe I think about every single penny. Everything adds up well to you. It's just like, oh, we need more ink. To me, it's like, shoot, we need more ink. That's another like two, three hundred dollars. <laughs> and you know, it's just not, I'm not trying to sound like I'm being cheap, but it's just, it adds up. It adds up quickly and I wouldn't do it any other way. I definitely, if I could do it all over again, I would do it all over again, if that makes sense. But I am nowhere close to where I wanna be. I am carving out the path for what I wanna do, but being an entrepreneur is definitely the right path for me because it just sits well with me. I'm a very high risk person. I'm a very competitive person by nature and I love to be challenged. So if you love all of those things, I would definitely say that quitting your nine to five could be for you. But you have to have that next level of stomach to handle the risk, have your ducks in a row, have your shit together, and have a game plan. Because if you fail to plan, you can plan to fail. I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little bit more about my story of quitting my nine to five. If you have more questions, please comment below. I'd love to share my experiences with you. Take care, guys. Have a great day.